So uh, when Alexis asked me last week to do the, uh, the service day because she was going down to Mexico, I really struggled with this. I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. You know, I've kind of... I've kind of done my life thing before, right? And, um, and my epiphany moment and kind of what brought me uh, to where I am in my faith journey. So I didn't really want to do that again. So what I was thinking about was uh, last week, I had the fortunate opportunity to spend 10 days with my nieces. Now, many of you know that my brother passed away suddenly last October and um, and that left us an opportunity to reconnect in a more um, intimate way with my two nieces. My nieces are uh, uh, 15 and 17, and actually Hannah, who is 17, turned 18 while she was here. So that was a blessing unto itself. Two things there. She was 18, was here, and it was actually my brother's birthday. So that was two difficult kind of days during that trip that we had to address. So then I started to reflect a little bit on the last 10 years of my life and to think that I added four kids, right? <laughs> still, still reeling about that one. Uh, my brother passed away and, and we got connected uh, more deeply with my nieces and, and the rest of my family. My sister-in-law just moved back in town, so that always adds a, uh, an extra amount of energy. And, and then the reality of it is, is by tallying up, I actually have 10 godkids. So that's a, little, <laughs> that's a little crazy. So in looking at that, I thought to myself, geez, you know, how do I in, influence these 10 kids and my nieces and, and all these other children that kind of come into Mars and life? How do, we, how do we positively impact them with the message? Because we ultimately have the responsibility, not only raising and affecting these children, but also feeding them and, and growing them in their, in their spirit. So I started to think back of what were the elements of my life that had the most impact on me. And one of them, and this, Mel is going to love this, but one of the biggest people that had an impact on my life early on was Charlton Heston. Now, you probably didn't see that one coming, right, Mel? <laughs> Charlton Heston. Why Charlton Heston? Well, Charlton Heston happened to be one of my uh, mother's favorite actors. And so we must have watched the Ben-Hur movie and Ten Commandments like a hundred times, right? Now, good thing it wasn't Burt Reynolds, right? Because that was her other favorite actor. He'd probably be doing Smokey and the Bandit. But, <laughs> but the Ten Commandments were those images, right? And then going, growing up in the Catholic Church, and I love the bell because... In the Catholic Church, we did a lot of bell ringing. There was, you know, there was saints. There was, you know, bloody saints everywhere. There was unbelievable stuff, right? The, the sensory stuff. But ironically, <laughs> looking back and thinking about the Ten Commandments movie, um, you know, that that was actually uh, the first time I was actually being visually fed uh, the message of the Bible. Now, if you look at the Ten Commandments, now the, the the commandments are found in the Book of Exodus. If you look at the commandments. Something surprisingly kind of popped in my head here, and that is that the first four commandments kind of tell you how to think about God, right? So we have the first one, there's only one God, you shall bring no false idols, do not use the Lord's name in vain, and hold, this, uh, hold the, uh, the Sabbath day holy, right? Those four are very specific instructions on how to have a relationship with God, but the other six instructions basically, are instructions on how to have a relationship with each other, right? First one, and I love this one. Children should honor their mother and father, right? Can I get amen to that one? Amen. All right. Amen. That never works, okay? Let me just tell you right now. Okay. Well, you shouldn't kill anybody. That's an obvious one, right? You shouldn't commit adultery, although could be fun. Not a good idea, okay? <laughs> not interested, Marcy, seriously. Uh, shall not steal... Shall not steal, right? Shall not uh, bear false witness, right? Shouldn't be taking things and beating our neighbors and things like that. And shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. Okay, so there's actually two in there. There's the adultery and the wife thing. Okay, so just as a case we didn't get that clear, right? You shouldn't be hanging out with other people's wives. So the interesting thing about that is those six commandments are actually relationships we have with each other. Now, as a parent... And I think as a child growing up, you know, we kind of struggle with these fifth one, which is honor thy mother and father. 
And I, and I love Don Huntington's uh, uh, sermon about a month ago when he pointed out on that particular one, it's really not about the kids specifically behaving to honor the mother and the father, but the parent's responsibility to affirm the child, right? If you affirm your children, right, and you support their children, then by default, they will honor you. And that was his key message, and I thought that was uh, very poignant. So as a parent, I think we struggle on how to interpret that. And, you know, so I was looking on the Internet, and I came across, and this was uh, a well-known poem on the Internet, and it kind of encapsulates, I think, our lives a little bit when we think about our fathers. At the age of four, we believe our father can do anything at all, right? Ben, we're, now Ben's not here. Ben thinks I'm great. You know, he thinks I can do anything. I can fix anything. I'm smart. You know, he's, he thinks I'm, I'm pretty cool. About the age of seven, yeah, your dad knows a lot. Yeah, maybe a whole lot, right? So Jacob's still kind of in that age where he thinks I kind of know a lot, right? Right around the age of eight, what Jacob is kind of pulling out, he starts to realize that maybe dad doesn't quite know anything, right? <laughs> now, Sam... On the other hand, going to the age of 13 and 14, father, naturally, that guy's hopeless and completely old-fashioned, knows nothing at all, right? At the age of 21, that's kind of hit its pinnacle, right? Where we say, oh, that guy's completely out of date. What did you expect? Didn't have an iPod, didn't have an iPhone, didn't have the internet, didn't have Windows 8, right? We're screaming things and stuff. Didn't have Minecraft, right? How could he possibly know anything that we know, right? They're nothing like us. At the age of 25, eh, maybe you start to realize he knows a little bit. At the age of 30, 30, when you start having your own kids, you find out that your dad, is, you know, you start worrying about what your dad's thinking about, right? Now you start having your own kids, like, hmm, what do my dad thinks about that? About the age of 35, we get a little more patient, and we tend to start calling up our dad a little more, right? Maybe reconcile with our dad at the age of 35, right? Right, from 21 to 35, blah, you know. But the age of 35, we start, maybe start reconciling a little bit, and we start to think, geez, what would my dad think about that first before I make that decision? About the age of 50, we probably have lost our father, and we start to think about what would dad have thought about that. At the age of 60, you start to realize that your dad knew a whole lot, right, because you had just raised all your kids, and wow, that was really hard, right? And about the age of 65, usually when it's too late, we usually ask ourselves, I wish I could talk to my dad one more time and ask him what he thought about what I did and the decisions I made with my kids. The reason we did the parable of the prodigal son was simple. The prodigal son is about, um, the, the youngest son is about, we don't have the theme music, thank God. <laughs> but the prodigal son is about that one kid that comes to his father, right? and is reckless, right? He comes to him and takes the father's money, runs off, and, but the father never gives up hope at all, right? He's a Christian man, he's pretty consistent. So the parable of the prodigal son, I think teaches us seven specific things that I kinda wanna outline in the next few minutes. The first is, God is telling us how to be a model father, and can I get an amen to that? Because I know I'm not a model father. I make mistakes in all seven of these. But the first is, is that the father teaches the truth from the infancy, right? He's caring for both sons consistently through the whole ordeal. And he tries to avoid being hypocritical, right? He tries to be avoid being mean to one and nice to the other and so on, right? And we all struggle with that, right? We all try to compare, right? Oh, like, you should be more like your good brother, right? That's what we probably would say to the younger one. The father has a respect for individual autonomy. That is, there's two kids and they're very different. And, you know, the strength and weaknesses of both have to be recognized. So they're two very different. Murphy is very different than Griff, and Samuel is very different than, than, than Jacob, and Ben, and Joe, and, and so on and so forth. The, fir the third lesson is that the father won't stand the way of consequences. And I love this saying. The premature rescue, which is no matter how many mistakes our kids make, no matter how hard it is. And I sit there and I watch Sam on his cell phone 
texting and getting himself trapped in this, this vampire web of sixth grade girls, right? <laughs> and just watch the venom spew out of these texts and so on and so forth, right? <laughs> Now, <laughs> this is the biggest mistake of it. You're never allowed to talk to them ever again. You know? And I don't really respect the fact that, um, that he should understand the consequences of that, learn the consequences. Now, we always use the word, well, that was the decision you make, and now here's your consequences. But we, we, just, we don't want them to make that mistake, so we kind of try to guide them early on with the premature consequences. Now, the father in the parable of prodigal son doesn't do that to the younger son, right? The younger son comes to him and says, hey, I want my inheritance now. I'm going to take off. I'm going to party with my buddies. And the father knows this is going to turn out bad. He knows he's going against God and being faithful like the older son, right? But he knows he's going to have a return. So he lets him go off and experience and fail for himself. The fourth lesson in the parable is the father has a love that refuses to give up. So you notice that we... When we had Sam up here, we had him scanning the horizon. And that's very evident in the parable, that the father is always scanning the horizon. He's never giving up on the younger son. He could have been down by the farm. He could have been working with the, with the rest of the, uh, the helpers and the older son. But every morning he gets up and he looks for his youngest son. And when he finds the youngest son, he doesn't wait for the younger son to come all the way back to the farm. He runs up to the younger son and grabs him and holds him and brings him back himself and rejoices. I think there's very few experiences in life where a child feels like he's been rejected by his parents, right, because of the decisions that he's made, right? I think we've all kind of felt that, right? We all make really bad decisions. I've made some very bad decisions in my life early on. And you feel bad as a child, even though all the mistakes you made, and you know you're making the mistakes because you realize you spent the money and you've done those things, but you realize really mostly that of all the mistakes you've made when a parent rejects you, that's a very bad thing. So the father doesn't do that. He, doesn't, he never gives up on his son. He's always scanning the horizon to make sure that his son will come home. The fifth is the father is forgiving. He spent half of his money already, right? All the money's gone. There's no money's coming back, right? Griffin's not coming back with a pile of cash. Say, oh, yeah, I made a mistake. Here's half of your money back. All the money's gone, right? He squandered everything they gave to him. He's very forgiving. As a matter of fact, not only is he forgiving, he runs up and embraces him and kisses him. So God and, and Jesus is teaching us in this parable that forgiveness is the core of, of Christian love. Number six, the father is a celebratory man means when he comes back in, he not only forgives him, he throws him a huge party, right? Gives him the best things. And now there's some subtle things in there. The first is the robe represents honor in the Bible. The ring represents authority. In the parable, there's a shoes uh, that are given, a new pair of sandals that are given to the prodigal son, and that represents a certain amount of freedom. So those that have shoes and those that have rings and those that have nice robes represent a certain order of class in the Bible. And the last thing is the model father is willing to live with ambiguity because the key character in the parable is not the father. It's not Griffin, the younger son. The key, the key character in this story is the older brother. And why is he the key character? He's the last person in the story. He's the last person for a reason. So Murphy is the key character in the story. Because what Murphy is doing, he's coming to his father and saying, hey, what's the deal? Like I've been working on your farm and I've been doing all these things for you and you throw this, this guy that's been going out spending all our money, throwing and having a party. He acknowledges the older son's concern and said, hey, I get the fact that you're upset, but I'm telling you that I want to forgive your youngest brother. And matter of fact, the older brother doesn't partake in the party, right? He kind of shuns the party and kind of... Oh, so the father is living with the ambiguity of the joyous behavior of the younger son and the 
anxiety and the anger of the oldest son, and that's okay. Now, none of us know the future. And being a father or being a mother can be very stressful, and there's no contract, right? <laughs> and we live with ambiguity every day, right? You know, I have four kids, I, you know, and now several animals, and we'll talk about that later. But, you know, those things fight all the time, right? And, like, you can't take sides, you can put them apart, you can say, oh, you know, you're my, you know, whatever, you know. I love you, and, you know, you should be more like him, and blah, blah. Right, so we have to live with ambiguity every day and accept the fact of life and just move on. So when Joe has a temper tantrum or Benny, it's hard, right? And he's sitting around going like this and doing all this stuff, right? It's really hard, right? Just to not, oh man, I'm just, you know, I have to go back to like instruction number three there or stuff like that, living with the consequences, right? So I have to live with ambiguity every day. So really the final reward here it's interesting. The final reward, and kind of alluded to, to what Charlene started with the, um, with the call to worship and the bringing in the spirit. Now, the final reward as a parent can sometimes be construed as saying, wasn't I a good father? Geez, I really tried hard, right? Really tried hard. Did everything right. <coughs> At least we, we think we did it right. And we know we didn't do everything right. We made mistakes along the way, according to this parable. But really... Our final reward is with all those temptations and all of those ambiguities and all of those stresses of raising those. If we follow these seven, your reward is to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Your reward is to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. So the fact that you have to deal with all the ambiguities with raising children. And I know I'm kind of just starting off. I only got, you know, four. <laughs> no, we're done. But we only have four. And every time I sit there in our, in our 12 passenger van and I put friends in there and I put loved ones in there and I watch them fight and argue and I sweat. And I was like, oh God, this is not going to end well. And I try to be a good dad, you know, and I know I make a lot of mistakes. You know, I, I don't do any of these seven things all the time. God is saying, if you try, at least try to do those seven things, you'll be welcomed into the kingdom of God as a good and faithful servant. Amen.